Great. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Carrie Young, San Francisco Heritage's Communications and Programs Manager. And I'm also here with Woody LeBounty, uh, Heritage's VP of Advocacy and Programs. And today we're going to do this impromptu webinar about the Parkside District. And we'll talk about Parkside history and our work in the district as part of the program Heritage in the Neighborhoods. And really quickly, I want to mention if anyone is tuning in, if you want to ask questions, you can ask them in the chat box or the Q and A, use the Q and A button in your Zoom window. And so Woody, what is Heritage in the Neighborhoods? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, let's see if I can actually get us moving. Here you go. So Heritage in the Neighborhoods is a new program that we came up with late last year in which we are going to three different neighborhoods this year uh, in San Francisco to basically bring our resources and our effort and focus to these neighborhoods to see if we can help them with preservation projects and trying to like recognize the cultural and architectural heritage that these neighborhoods have. So we started with the Excelsior in March and now we're in the Parkside. And then later this year, we're going to be in the Marina District. So here's a cute cartoon map from 1939 showing the three different neighborhoods that we're focusing on. And you can see they're in, they're kind of spread out through the city. And the main idea here is that we want to be as San Francisco Heritage in every corner of San Francisco, because when it comes to historic preservation, you know, it doesn't stop at the, the oldest parts of the city. Um, the newer parts of the city have great character and resources as well and deserve our attention. Um, and if you look at the city in general, there are some differences in how neighborhoods are treated in recognizing these, um, these cultural and architectural resources. Yeah, and if you look at a map of our designated city landmarks, you'll see that most of them are really clustered in the northeastern part of the city. And the three neighborhoods that we are focusing on this year are really underrepresented on this map. And if you look around the park side, there isn't even one landmark, right? That's right. So there, there are things out there, though. I guess this is the big focus of Heritage in the Neighborhood, showing people that there are important structures and businesses in these neighborhoods, even if they don't get the big citywide attention usually. So this is Terravel Street in the Parkside uh, between 25th and 24th Avenues. And these are three early craftsman homes that were built by one of the officers of the Parkside Realty Company. So very early, 1907, but this one's gone. This one's gone, it's been destroyed, demolished over the years and there's new buildings. And this one on the end is still there. It's 1420 Terravel Street, uh, early craftsman house. It totally calls back to the beginnings of this neighborhood in 1907. Um, it's still in excellent condition, has its original porch and uh, the shingling. Um, it's had some changes, but unfortunately, these buildings aren't valued if you don't get ahead of the planning processes and the development projects that start. So this house in, in specific, uh, the Board of Supervisors just uh, denied an appeal this last Tuesday to, to save it and it will be demolished and a new structure will be put in that doesn't really call to the Parkside's history or character. So our idea is that we go to these places and try to get ahead of these projects and help the neighborhood recognize what it values and what it feels represents their neighborhood. So let's talk about the Parkside. Carrie, if I yeah. could go back way back time travel to the year 1900, um, what would I see in the Parkside Sunset area? Well, you would see a lot of sand, that's for sure. <laughs> and you can see here in the foreground, that is Carl Larson's chicken ranch at today's kind of between Noriega and Moraga and 17th and 16th Avenue. And that path beyond there that you can see is called the Central Ocean Road. And it's a graded route that wiggles kind of from the Inner Sunset to Lake Merced. And today, kind of the six lane 19th Avenue runs about there. Right. Yeah, but 
you know, a lot of people probably aren't aware that most of the west side of the city, you know, including Parkside, was once what people called really cold desert of sand and fog, as you can see here. Right. Lots of dunes. Right. And people generally lump the Parkside in with the Sunset District. Um, but the whole Sunset District south of Golden Gate Park uh, developed in different sections and different stages. So you had the inner sunset with the first buildings coming in in like the 1880s, just a few. And then in the 1890s, out at the beach, people had uh, beach cottages and used old streetcars and cable cars as little cottages at the beach. And then the park side starts in the early 1900s. And then Golden Gate Heights, all the houses up on the hill don't come until the 1920s. So if you look at Parkside of these different neighborhoods that all knit together to form the sunset by World War II, Parkside is the farthest away from Golden Gate Park. So why is it called the Parkside? Well, well, the Parkside, it was actually near some trees and a natural lake. And today, this woody gully is the st uh, Stern Grove and Pine Lake Park. And people originally called the Salty Lake kind of in amongst the dunes, Pig Lake and Mud Lake, and it was used to water livestock and nearby ranches. And here are some of those cows now. <laughs> well, they're Lake. not there now. <laughs> not now, but then, <laughs> an example. And uh, so other than a few farmers and ranchers around Lake Merced, you know, the only other thing you'd find out in the Parkside area in 1900 would be the Trocadero Roadhouse, which you can see here, uh, built in the 1890s for, you know, for travelers really looking for a good time. And it's still there in Stern Grove, and you might have seen it, you know, as you walk down to Stern Grove for the festival or just to walk around. Uh, but, you know, interestingly, it's not a landmark yet. Right. It has no protection. Okay, so let's get the park side started. 1905, William Crocker and a bunch of other investors buy up a lot of these lots um, that are on maps. Streets and lots are all defined on maps at this time, but there's no infrastructure, there's no real streets, there's no houses. Um, but they buy up all these lots and they have this plan for this new residential neighborhood that they call the park side. So this is a 1938 aerial. Um, I realize that I'm going to show you some. I'm going to, you might need to move our cameras to the left here because I want to show you something on the right side of the screen. So this is the Parkside 1938. It's built up here, but this is the early map. Let me see if I can get it for you. There you go. That the Parkside Realty Company comes up with to lay out the Parkside. Um, so the western boundary is 33rd Avenue. The south is where Slope Boulevard is today. And the north is uh, about Ortega. And you can see on the east, there's a very strange diagonal boundary. It's like, why do they cut this at this strange uh, diagonal cut here? But if you look in the 1938 map, uh, you can actually see the boundary still here in the streets. Um, here, I'll draw the line for you. Ooh. Yeah. So this boundary is real. It's not just on the maps, but it's actually a boundary separating the park side from West Portal. And it dates back to the Mexican era when a land grant was created and they just sort of drew these things with rulers on maps. And you have the diagonal boundary here of the old Rancho San Miguel. So that's kind of interesting, I think, that you could still see uh, these, this, this era, Mexican era line in the park side. Okay, so back to the map. Uh, they're all ready to get going now. They've laid out their map. The red lines are streetcar lines they plan. They're ready to build houses and sell lots. And mostly they're thinking larger country houses to sell to people. But then April 1906 comes around and something happens. Yes, well, only one of the deadliest earthquakes <laughs> in the history of the, U the US hits San Francisco and the wider Bay Area. And the, uh, with destruction really magnified by fires that burn across the city for three days after the shaking. Um, and, you know, during this massive earthquake and fire, more than 200,000 people are displaced in San Francisco. 
And this is a look towards Telegraph Hill and North Beach, just that really shows the magnitude of the, dev you know, the devastation that happened. And this is a look at the South of Market District during that time where many of the working class lived in San Francisco. And so, you know, the Parkside Realty Company sees an opportunity in this disaster to kind of, you know, profit from this. So what, right. kind of, what happens? Well, they, they, they think that, well, now we build working men's cottages, right? There's all these people that are homeless that are going to rebuild the city. So maybe we'll change our plan a little and build houses for the working class. But they get caught up in the corruption trials, the graft trials that happened right after the earthquake and fire. And it turns out that to get their streetcar lines, they had given some bribes to supervisors to get the franchises. So that delays their plans as they go through the trials, but eventually they do get their franchise back and they start building in late 1907. Mm -hmm. And these red lines that you can see on the map, those were the streetcar lines. And the map also shows some of the lots that were supposed, supposedly sold around 1908. And I want to zoom in a little bit on that what is that squiggly line there, Woody? Yeah, it's down here. Yeah, near the center. Well, it's funny. It's, these are lots that are sold and built upon. These are cottages that are built right on top of the old Central Ocean Road that you mentioned that went kind of wiggled from the inner sunset to Lake Merced. And our idea is that these were the first cottages are built in the parkside. And we think they built them here kind of farther out and along the road probably because it was easier grading. The road was already graded. So why not get ahead of having to like, you know, grade all these sand dunes and put in all this infrastructure. You already have a graded path. There was a giant sand dune right here that the road kind of skirted to the south of. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and they might've just been trying to seed the district, you know, put these houses, first houses throughout their map to try to get people not to just cluster in the first part and see if they could sell them throughout the park throughout the, the development rather. Yeah. Um, and these are the first cottages. There's about 62 of them, I think 62, that they build in 1907, 1908. And they're small little 800 square foot cottages, five rooms. They all have the same floor plan and uh, they just have different facade treatments that the Parkside Realty Company gives them. And if you go out there today between, um, you can see that they still have the same, uh, the same facades, but they're still out there. You still find a lot of these cottages. Yeah, they're still out there kind of in running in clumps of four to five, I would say from, you know, 26th Avenue and Uloa uh, down to the corner of 32nd and Vicente. And garages have been, you know, added to most, as you can see here. And also, you know, many have been modified like these. Um, but even some of the new remodel, remodeling jobs have kept, kept some of the original kind of shingle look, which is really nice. And yeah, I like yeah and if, if we're talking about potential landmarks or historic districts in the park side, I think, you know, some of these original cottages would be a good place to start. Right. So they build these 60 cottages for these working people and they, they, they get sold. Um, they're pretty cheap. But when you're moving out there in 1908, 1909, you're living in the country. It is foggy and sandy. This is 31st Avenue near uh, Vicente, uh, Vicente. And you could tell it's like the street isn't even there yet. This is a giant <laughs> sand hill and the kids could just picnic on, in the middle of 31st Avenue today. Um, it is a very uh, rustic rural area out there. Yeah, and this is a, a view of the cottages uh, at Vicente and 23rd. You can see the, you know, the 32nd, giant, 32nd, 32nd, sorry. And you can see that giant sand dune that Woody mentioned earlier that was, was right next to kind of the new cottages. And, you know, uh, I wanted to mention that before that streetcar line was finished, that commuters had to walk from Lincoln all the way home to the Parkside District in the dark and across these sandy dunes. There were no street lights or street signs. Um, yeah, it was uh, its own little village out there. It's a pioneer. It's yeah. definitely pioneer days. 
Um, the Parkside Realty Company does get around to building larger and craftsman houses and arts and crafts, bungalows. Um, this yellow house on the right here, this is across the street from 1420 Terravel, and it's the sole remaining house in that giant clump. There's about five or six houses that the, the builder had built. So hopefully this one survives. Um, they, they built about 120 of these craftsman homes before World War I, um, but it still kind of went a little slow, right, Carrie? Yes, <laughs> so this is a view west on Terrible from 33rd at, at, the, at the edge of the park side in uh, 1920. And you can see that, well, some sidewalks are at least put in by then, but yeah. the, <laughs> the development is still pretty slow, as you can see. And uh, some of these original houses out there are actually still around and standing, and they are hiding in plain sight, as you can see. Yeah, these houses are these houses. Okay, so first, Again, we're in a country village, not an, a city neighborhood. Right. 1909, this is the first Parkside school. It's a one-room one schoolhouse. Um, they have to basically create their own fire department. Over here on the right, this is their volunteer fire department that they build at 28th Avenue in Uloa. It says above the door there, uh, PSVFO, Parkside Volunteer Fire De oh, o D, I'm sorry, <laughs> department. It looks like an O. It looks like, it looks like an O. Yeah. Uh, on the left here, they have one store. Eugene Williams has a grocery store at 32nd and Terraval. And this is it with the volunteer fire people posing in front. Um, so you have one store to get your groceries, one store to get anything um, yeah. in these early days. And Williams had a hall upstairs as well. And there were community meetings and social events held there back in the day. And actually in the 1920s then, the building was remodeled and a stucco exterior and a corner bay were added. And today, the building is still there and it's now Jean's Liquors. And if you wanna learn more, actually, the Western Neighborhoods Project dedicated uh, an entire podcast episode to the history of this building uh, that I highly recommend. And, but you know, and we're, when we're talking about potential local landmarks and legacy businesses, I think Jeans Liquors you know, qualifies for both, certainly. Sure, it's like the first business, right? Yeah. Uh, has the same name. Okay, so in 1918, the Muni starts and they have the Twin Peaks Tunnel come in. Well, the Muni started in 1912, but they build the Twin Peaks Tunnel in 1918, uh, West Portal. And this is gonna be a fast commuter line downtown. So they really think the El Terravel, which starts in 1919, is going to really help this neighborhood boom. But as you can see, it's pretty slow going still. It's uh, kind of like going through the Sahara Desert uh, to take the El Terravel out to the end of the line from through most of the sunset. Um, but the 1920s, they do, uh, they do have a building boom that starts. We get the Roaring Twenties. And this gentleman here on the left, Ernest Swanson, works for the Parkside Realty Company, designing and building a lot of the stucco houses, you might say, that you can find through the neighborhood and that were built in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he actually chose to live in the Parkside himself, and his house is still standing there at 2000 Uloa Street at, mm -hmm. at 21st Avenue. Yeah, and, and the Parkside Realty Company sold some of the lots to other companies like the Lang Realty Company. And a lot, this is when the Parkside really fills in during the 20s and early 30s. The stucco houses that you see in the Parkside are, are a, a cut above most of the houses you'll see throughout the sunset. They have shaped staircases. The, the treatments of the facades are more elaborate. They really go for it with these sort of Baroque uh, cutouts and window facades. Uh, red clay tile roofs. It's, it's what's popular at the time, these Mediterranean revival styles, but in the Parkside, you really get a lot of great uh, uh, examples of it, you might say. And with the sandy blocks all finally being filled in, the commercial strip on Terravel starts to come to life in the 1920s. Yeah, and so we start to see hardware stores and restaurants and bakeries and other grocery stores pop up and the Parkside Theater that you can see here, it opens in 1928. The building is actually still there. 
the facade on Terraville, unfortunately, is painted this really drab gray color. For wow, 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 wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the main parts of the theater building uh, were recently repainted, uh, this kind of more bright orangey color. And it's actually, um, I heard, currently for sale. So I'm, you know, saving my, my quarters and my piggy bank. <laughs> I'll just say. Do you, do you want to own the old Parkside Theater? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'm, I'll be saving. <laughs> Make them an offer. Make yeah. them an offer. So I think this aerial from 1928, the theater was built in 1928, uh, really shows how the Parkside was its own neighborhood. Um, if you look, it's sitting out there surrounded by sand dunes and by Pine Lake and uh, Stern Grove. It, it, it's a separate neighborhood. It, it's living in isolation in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, they, they're starting to fill it in as you can see. And so the Parkside Realty Company starts thinking, well, okay, maybe we've got it together now and we can actually start filling in this area around Stern Grove and Pine Lake. Now in the original map, they actually planned to just build over all these trees in the lake. Um, that was their proposal. Um, but by the late 1920s, they're doing well and they think, well, you know, why don't we build a, a mini residence park in a sense in the land next to the lake? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, really quickly though, if you look closely, you can see that original line of Parkside Cottages running down the hill there. And again, that giant dune next to them. And yeah, yeah there it is. The dune, the dune is slightly smaller, it's getting graded. Yeah, um, they're starting to put the streets in. They're starting to get it. So. Yeah, and so this new mini neighborhood is called Pine Lake Park. And the first houses there are, you know, Spanish and Tudor style houses on 34th Avenue and Crest Lake Drive. Right. Yeah. And with Pine Lake Park, they, they really decide to make the lake and the trees and Stern Grove a, an amenity rather than fill it in and build a bunch more houses of the top of it. Um, so they take out ads where people are canoeing and picnicking and they're showing birds in the trees and it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they announced it in 1927, they really start building 1927, 1928. But like with all Parkside Realty Company ventures, things go sluggish and don't really take <laughs> off right away. Yeah, well, it, Pine Lake Park, it was, you know, planned as a small version of nearby residence parks like uh, Forest Hill and St. Francis Woods. Uh, you know, the street plan had curving avenues, utilities were undergrounded, and homes were detached. There was a bit more space uh, with front setbacks and lawns and, you know, styles were high-end and period revival. Yeah. Because that's what people wanted. They wanted to look yeah. like old European sort of things. Mm -hmm. It's no St. Francis Wood, but it is, it is a little nicer than, uh, than the rest of the Parkside. And eventually, the Parkside Realty Company sell out to the Sunstream, uh, Sunstream Homes, which is the standard building company run by these two brothers, the Gellert brothers. And the Gellert brothers in the 40s, before the war, and then after the war, uh, bring in a lot of ranch style homes, suburban feeling houses that you might see in Westlake. Um, so that's why Pine Lake Park is sort of this mix of these period revival 30s homes and these post-war ranch style houses. But you still have the undergrounded util utilities, the, the wide lots, the uh, front setbacks, um, but it's more of a suburban feeling ranch style uh, vibe, you might say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm pivoting a little bit now. Um, because the Parkside developed kind of more as a village than a neighborhood, it had its own cultural t traditions. And uh, the Parkside always had really strong community groups as well. Uh, the Parkside District Improvement Club, for example, held big May Day festivals each year from the 1930s to the 1970s. And this, uh, they would crown a, a girl, a neighborhood girl, as the May Day Queen each year. And this is a photo of Marilyn Crane uh, in 1944, who was the May Day Queen in the Coffin Square. And the Parkside District Improvement Club, you know, they held dances, they held block parties and dinners and community meetings, and you know, they lobbied for neighborhood services. 
uh, including a big push to have Lincoln High School built in the district. Um, but by the time you know World War II ended, it seemed Parkside had everything really, uh, yeah. except for non-white people. <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it was one, one of the most homogenous and, and uh, white neighborhoods in the city for years. It was always thought to be a very, a very conservative neighborhood. And the Parkside District Improvement Club were, you know, they didn't, they really, you know, fought hard to keep it white. I got to say, they like write, wrote letters to real estate agents, you know, worried that uh, like Filipino family might move in. There was a letter from the 40s on that. But by the time the late 60s come around, Lincoln High School has a lot of African-American students there, and there's a lot of tensions that are growing in this all-white neighborhood. Um, there's altercations, but there's also uh, clubs that are formed. There's real efforts to try to reach some uh, racial equity, uh, especially discrimination against teachers and students, and the students and white students and black students come together um, for some of these summits. And, uh, but the Parkside District essentially has to face up to racial inequities, just like we do today. It's no different. Um, it was just a bit of a culture shock, I think, for the Parkside in general, like it is for a lot of places in the late 1960s. So I look, and now I, you know, I lived in the Parkside, and I would ask you, Carrie, if you look at the Parkside today, with all these changes in the 60s and 70s, has it, has it really changed? Well, well, the physical landscape hasn't changed much at all. <laughs> As you can see from this picture in 1946 uh, at Terrell and 21st, uh, a lot of the buildings are still very much intact and remain the same. Uh, but some things have changed. And you know, now more than half of the Parkside residents uh, identify as being of Asian descent. And a lot of Chinese American families have moved in since the 1990s. And that's really, you know, evident in a lot of the businesses there, as you can see. Right. Yeah. Right. In some ways, I don't think it's changed. I mean, you might have different demographics, but, you know, here's the Parkside District Improvement Club. These families having big May Day festivals in McCoppin Square in the 40s. And then, you know, now we have the movies in McCoppin. Uh, nightly, you know, these movie nights they have through the summer and fall that the people of the Parkside Sunset community group put on. And I think it's still attractive to families who like the quiet streets and the parks all around, the, uh, the attractive houses. It's a very family feeling neighborhood. And I think it's still attractive to, to, that, to that group today. You know, it's like, it's a great place to raise kids. I actually, my daughter was a good portion of her childhood was spent in the Parkside. So we really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. So back to our goals for heritage in the neighborhoods. Um, primarily, we have three main goals. And one is to bring a citywide focus and our resources to these what we call unsung neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Neighborhoods that just aren't talked about as much when you talk about uh, architecture and culture. Right, and we also hope to uh, have a preservation accomplishment, you know, to build momentum for our work there. And that could be landmarking a building or helping with legacy businesses, uh, business uh, registrations, for example. And we hope that that will lead to then the next thing. Yeah, to this idea of having a group of people there, right? It's like, you know, the neighbors, they know what they want. They know what they care about. So we want to help, help them help, mm -hmm. you know, keep the neighborhood strong and figure out what they identify as what makes the Parkside the Parkside, for example. So we want to help try to help coalesce all the people who are interested. Right. So how do we do that? Well, we do it through our website, like you're doing now. You're watching us talk about it. We're trying to get the news out to media and get the news out to uh, bloggers and all sorts of people out there who maybe just don't think about the Parkside much. Yeah. And we also want to highlight the park side in our publications and on social media. Our last uh, Heritage News news a newsletter, for example, was focused on the park side. And we'll also continue throughout the month to highlight park side history, places, and people on our social media. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, just some ideas, right? So. Yeah. What about, and, you know, that's, what about this, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. There's. There's a lot of potential preservation projects, uh, as, as we've already mentioned. And here's another great example, the Parkside Branch 
library uh, designed in 1951. It was the, the first of eight modern libraries uh, by Appleton Wolford for the SF Public Library. And actually it's, you know, its counterpart in the Marina District has already become a landmark. Uh, but right. this was the first of those libraries and it's, it's not de designated in the same way. Yeah, and I mean, this is a very well-traveled, everybody in the Parkside knows the library, but, but then, you know, a little bit off the beaten path, you might say, the Pinehurst Lodge down at 30th Avenue in Escolta, I think is an amazing building with a very long history of uh, service that, you know, I think would be good to highlight and talk about. They're on their own little campus there. Um, these are the kind of things that we'd like to get more attention to and see if there's some sort of protections that can be brought forward. And, you know, it's not just about buildings, right, Carrie? I mean, everybody knows the Tennessee Grill, for example, right. in the Parkside, and there's lots of businesses like that. Yeah, and especially now, you know, these businesses need our help more than ever. And, you know, we, through this project, we really want to emphasize that preservation isn't just about saving and honoring mansions of wealthy people and those in power. You know, it's San Francisco is also made up of working class, you know, people, neighborhoods, and, you know, beloved longtime family businesses and spaces, libraries and parks. And so these all need to be preserved too. And that's what, you know, a big part of what we want to be focusing on with heritage in the neighborhoods. Right. And like you said, you know, I think right now we really want to focus on helping businesses during the pandemic. They're very, they're suffering. So here's how you can get involved if you want to be part of our Parkside Month. You know, first of all, let us know if you have an interest in this neighborhood. You already maybe have knowledge. Uh, you want to be part of this whole project. Just reach out to us. We'll give our contact info in a second. And then, of course, you could nominate your own legacy business that you think uh, deserves recognition or a building that you think should be landmarked. And we're going to have some events, you know. We're, the nice thing about Zoom and about these online things is that everybody can get together and talk and kind of create a plan. So we're going to do more of this um, online. We hope to have in-person events, but we can't do that right now. So just come back to sfheritage.org slash Parkside. You can read about all the things we're doing during the month in the Parkside. We're going to post resources and groups to be involved with and dates in which we're going to try to get together and see if we can accomplish something. Here's our contact info again. It's sfheritage.org slash parkside. I'm Woody Labounty. I'm at wlabounty at sfheritage.org. Yeah, and I'm Carrie Young, K Young at sfheritage.org. And again, here's our you know social media and please follow us and we'll be covering the parkside all month and so you can keep up with news. And I think quickly we're gonna check to see if there are any questions. Um, let's see. Do I have any questions? Do you have any questions? <laughs> I don't know. I kind of feel like, uh, I think Great Wall Hardware is a legacy business, but I don't think Tennessee Grill is. So I kind of like to it talk about the, that. Oh the, yeah. Great Wall Hardware is the only legacy business, I believe, in the book side. That's good. Deservedly. I just kind of feel like, for example, Tennessee Grill feels to me like, a natural um, yeah. and being on the legacy business registry does have benefits that the city offers to help these these businesses so you know that might be a good start project um, oh gold oh, gold mirror is ah, gold mirror. Business, of course. yeah it's funny the other side of 19th avenue there's parts of it that are the park side so yeah. we're not going to forget 18th avenue as well so yeah another great one um it doesn't look like there are any other questions, so I think Great. we... Well, just get involved. Let us know if you have any questions or you want to figure out how to be involved or suggestions. Um, we're going to be doing something every day on the park side pretty much all through July. And, uh, and thank you, Carrie, for doing this little talk with me today. Yeah, thank you, Woody. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Great. See you soon.